Oh, off. I'm not sure. Yeah. Was it on originally? It was, yeah. I must have been fooling around in my pocket or something like that. All right. Okay. So those are the, yeah, it does make a difference. Sorry about that. All right. So this is the fourth example. And this, so the examples I've went through so far are just meant to illustrate certain points and illustrate the basic idea of Gauss elimination. Okay. Now hopefully, based on what you've learned in MATLAB so far, you might get an idea that this kind of algorithm is amenable, like you could write a piece of code that does this, right? So I'm not going to make you do it, but you could imagine, and it's, it's in MATLAB obviously, that someone gives you a matrix A and B and then you perform all these row operations and you spit back this R and F, right? So let's say you're interested in doing that, then how you know, these operations that I've told you about are not unique, right? There's more than one way to do this kind of thing. Like, instead of making it upper triangular, you could make it lower triangular. Or you could switch rows and columns and then start. Not columns, sorry. You could switch rows. So the question is, is there a better way to do this? Um, and why does it matter? Well, it matters because the things along the diagonal like this number here matters, right? Because I'm going to multiply this and add it to the other rows. If this number is like really, really small, that's maybe not a good idea. Like if that's 10 to the minus 9th, what am I going to multiply 10 to the plus 9th and add it to this one? You can see this is probably asking for trouble, <laughs> okay? You might say, well, this is never going to be 10 to the ni minus 9th, and then the answer is actually you're wrong, okay? If this matrix gets big, which I'll explain as we move along in the course, it's very likely bad things will happen in terms of some of these numbers. By big, I mean big, like a thousand by a thousand, something like that. You might say, there's no matrices that are a thousand by a thousand. Guess what I'll say? Wrong again. Okay. So when you start getting real problems, matrices get large. And when matrices get large, you start having problems with these algorithms. So the point I'm trying to illustrate here is how one would actually think about implementing this type of algorithm if you wanted to write a code. Okay. So let's say you have this example here. All right. So you say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to form my augmented matrix. There's A and there's B. Now obviously at this point, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out I'm not going to achieve much by multiplying this and adding it to the other rows because that element is zero. So I'd be kind of stupid to do that. So I bet, right, my goal is to make a triangular matrix. I want all the elements below the diagonal to be zero. So I, I can't use that equation to do it. So I could use either that equation or that equation. Okay. The, qu the answer is which equation should I use? And the argument here is that you should use this equation because this equation has the largest number in that element right there, six. Okay. So I'm going to reorder this matrix like this. I'm going to switch these two rows around, right? these two equations, and I'm going to rewrite it like this. It's equivalent right? to switch two rows. I want to use this now I'm going to take this row, multiply it, and eliminate this element here. It's obvious I can multiply this by minus one half and add it to this row and that'll make that zero. The reason I'm using six instead of three, because six is larger than three, and that number right there is called the pivot. So in the Gauss um, algorithm, Gauss elimination algorithm, this would be called the pivot. Okay. This is the number that I'm really choosing so that when I multiply, I make another number zero. Okay? I want that number to be as large as possible because that will minimize the chance of bad numerical things happening, which we'll talk about. Okay? So I do that and I'm like, okay, looks good. Okay? Got this now. Okay? Now once I get here, you can appreciate that I want to make this thing zero, right? But I could make this thing zero by either multiplying this and making it zero, right? I could multiply this times minus one half and add. Or I could switch these two rows, right? That row and that row and then do the other way. It's actually better to switch the two rows because then I get a larger pivot. The next thing I'm going to do is switch these two rows. And if I do that, I get this. All I've done is switch the two rows. I've done that because I want the number eight here instead of the number four because eight's bigger than four. So I'm trying to rearrange these rows when I do these operations. So the pivot, what I'm going to multiply to make other elements zero is as large as possible. Okay. So now I've got this guy. I'm going to multiply this times minus one half and add it to this row. And if I do, I'll get that. Okay. 
And if now it's triangular, right? So I like for example this equation is minus three x three equals minus uh, three halves, and that's equal 0.5, and so on and so forth, right? Once you get a triangular, it's easy to solve. Okay, you might say, oh, so I'd have got a different answer if I'd have done it a different way. The answer is no, <laughs> not for this problem, because this problem is really nice. It's really small, and all the numbers are really nice, right? All the numbers are order one or order ten, and there's only three equations. So this problem doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you don't make a mistake. But what I'm saying, generally speaking, when you, if you were to write a piece of code, you don't know what A matrix you're going to get. You're not guaranteed to get a nice, small problem. So in that case, you want to use this idea of pivoting. Okay? Pivoting just means you're going to exchange rows and columns, oh, sorry, just rows, so that when you do this multiplication and add, you're using the largest elements you can. Okay? And that's because which I am about to show, small pivots can cause numerical problems. Okay, so here is um, a problem. Let's see, I'm kind of wanting some coffee. It's awesome. I'm going to get some, okay? All right, so look at this problem. So let's say someone gives you this problem and says, please solve this problem for me. You're like, okay. I know the algorithm. I'm going to take Right, this is really easy. I only need to do one step. I just need to multiply this row times something and add it to that row to make that thing zero. Now I'm a little bit suspicious here because that number is a little bit small, right? But I just do it anyway. So that's what I'm saying. Do not pivot. So I'm not going to exchange these two rows and do it. I'm just going to do it the bad way to start with to prove a point. So I'm going to multiply the first equation by this number, right? I'm going to multiply it by this number because that makes this number, or I think it makes this number zero, right? And then I'm going to add it to the second equation, but what, in order to make my point here, I have, to use a, I have to use a finite number of significant digits. You understand on a computer, you've got a lot more than four significant digits. But you also might do millions of calculations so that if you have round off error, a million times and numbers are really small, they accumulate and if you're using really small numbers, bad things might happen. So to mimic that, I'm doing only a single calculation but I'm assuming a small number of significant digits. Like mimics doing many calculations with a lot of significant digits like on a computer. Okay, so if I have a finite number of significant digits here, so I'm multiplying, you understand why I'm doing this multiplication, right? Because I'm going to add this to this, that'll make this guy zero. See if I believe myself. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, confused myself. All right. So obviously, if I multiply the first equation by this number, then I'm going to get this number here. I subtract it, and then that'll make that thing zero. At least I think it will. And then if I have a finite number of significant digits, meaning only four of them, I'll end up with this. Okay. In other words, this isn't exactly the number, it's pretty darn close, but it's not exact. Okay. Now I can solve this set of equations, and if I do that, this, the, the real solution to this problem I can tell you is 10 and 1. In other words, if you use infinite number of significant digits, the, an the true answer is 10 and 1. And you would find 10 and 1 in MATLAB, because MATLAB is a simple problem with a lot of significant digits. But if you only use 4, then you end up with this thing after you do Gaussian elimination. If you solve it, you get this. Right, x2 is quite close. That's almost one. But because this element here is really small, you end up thinking x1 is 12 and a half instead of 10. Okay. So this problem wouldn't have occurred if I had done the smart thing and that switched these two rows and then multiplied this equation to make that thing zero. Okay. So this idea of numerics actually matters. And when you get a problem when you run these kind of problems in MATLAB, it's, it's common that MATLAB will give you back a message that says something like MATLAB gives you two types of messages. One is a warning. Okay, warning says, I think you should know this. A lot of times the warnings are useless, I have to admit, but sometimes they're actually good. It might say, I think your matrix is bad. It's ill-conditioned. We'll come, come to this. What it's telling you is, I've given you an answer. It's up to you to determine if you believe it. <laughs> okay. And error just means you've got that already, right? It just means you made some kind of error. I can't do anything, okay? But war so for this kind of problem, not this one because it has a lot more significant digits, but if you get problems that look like this, 
they're usually bigger and harder to see that there's a problem, then MATLAB will often give you back a message that says, I'm concerned about the problem you've given me, and although I've given you an answer, I can't guarantee it's very accurate. Okay. And so that's what you see here. So you, you would not accept this answer, right? Like this is a very small error, but I mean this is like a 25% error in X1. It's not, not going to be acceptable. Okay, so one thing about um, computational efficiency. So let's say you wanted to write a code to do this. So you, you, it's, not, it's not that hard. It would be cumbersome and you guys don't know how to code that well because you haven't really done it. But you know, so what are you going to do? You're going to take a matrix. You're going to look for the pivot, right? You're going to switch rows to get the... What would you do? You look at this problem, you just do what we did on this problem. You look at this matrix and you say, oh, I'm going to make it triangular. First thing I better do is switch the two rows to get that, right? I mean, to get that. Then I'm going to eliminate these two elements, then I'm going to switch these two rows and I'm going to finalize by getting that. And that's your, you write a piece of code that does that for a matrix of any size, right? A bunch of if-then statements and loops and all these kind of things that I've introduced to you. All right. Um, so, We've learned that to do Gaussian eliminations, there's basically two things you have to do. First of all, you have to do get a triangular system. That process is called forward elimination. That's all the operations we focus on, right? Subtracting rows, switching rows. Once you have a triangular system, you do back substitution to solve it. That's usually pretty easy, okay? So this gives you something about um, how the computation scales. So when you do large-scale computation, meaning big problems, the scaling of the computation matters. Like, if the problem is three by three, then no, the efficiency doesn't matter at all. It's just you hit the button and you got the answer, right? But if, if the problem is, like I've seen people solve matrix problems that are a million equations and a million unknowns, okay? It's a refinery kind of problem. Then efficiency matters a lot. And the quality of the algorithm matters a lot. So. What this statement here is saying is if you want to solve a system of equations, so you have n equations and n unknowns, then the number of operations, you know what an operation means. It means to multiply a number, to add a number, to subtract a number, to switch a column, switch a row, switch an element. Those are all called operations. That the number of them to do elimination scales as the number of variables cubed. So when you start seeing scaling like that, you're like, uh-oh. Because cube is like a big power. <laughs> so it says, you know, and, uh, 10 cubed is what, 1,000, but, well, I'll go down to this thing here. You can see as n, as n grows, the number of calculations you have to perform, the number of operations grows as the cube. That means it's going to potentially be a problem. On the other hand, the substitution <coughs> problem, the back substitution problem, just scales as the number of variables squared. That's a much better scaling, okay? So this gives you some idea of this. Let's say each operation takes, what's this, a, is, that a, is that a picosecond, nanosecond? Help me out here. Nano, right, picos 10 to the minus 12, okay. So let's say each operation, I don't know if that's what a modern computer does, but it seems pretty small, seems not unreasonable, right? So let's say you have a problem that's a thousand equations and a thousand unknowns. We solve these kind of things in my lab, I'd say not only every day, but every few minutes, okay. So you look at this, the elimination part will take about a second, the back substitution part will take 10 to the minus 3, the whole calculation will take about one second. So in other words, hit the button, you get the answer, okay? Let's say it's 10,000 equations and 10,000 unknowns. This is still super fast, but now this takes 10 minutes, right? So you see the problem, you, you have what, 10 times the number of um, equations, and, but the, the computation time increased by a factor of what? 3,600 or something? Not something exactly. No, that's not right. 36,000, right? And that's because of this scaling right here, okay? So all these things having to do with like, you, you guys won't be probably too concerned as part of the stuff you do here at UMass with, you know, computational efficiency and whether the problem is accurate and whether the scaling of the problem is good and whether you, the solution is reliable. But once you go get a job, and you're going to solve, often using MATLAB in particular, problems that are actually big and complex, then these kind of things matter. I mean, if you're sitting, this is nice to know, right? This says go to the bathroom or get some coffee or take a nap, right? But it's, 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 it's kind of shocking, right? You run this thing, I've done this, right? You run something like this, comes back in one second. I might be doing a toy problem for class. Then I do this and run it and I'm just like, what's happening? 
right? And it's just because the scaling, the problem, even as, this is a modest increase in size, a factor of 10, it's not huge, leads to a huge increase in computation. Okay, so tomorrow we will um, do something in MATLAB, I don't remember what, linear algebra stuff, and then the homework is due, and I guess there's no help session tonight, someone told me, because the TA is busy or something, is that the idea? Busy, okay.